welcome to our final day. Um, just remind everybody that the abbreviated or shortened program for the, for the day, so talks 9, 10, 11, 15, and 12, 15. There's tea after the 10 o'clock talk. But, and then, uh, so anyway, all, all four packed into the morning and action packed, so then I guess dash off for lunch. So anyway, that's, you could all check the schedule, but it's, it, the, uh, that, that's for today. For now, I'm delighted to introduce Lisa Piccarello, who will tell us about four manifolds of boundary and fundamental group Z. Thanks, Denny. Yeah, um, thanks everybody for getting up early on the last day. I'm happy to be here. It's been a really wonderful conference and place to be. Um, I also like should take the opportunity to say whatever I want about Tom because he's conspicuously not there, but um, maybe I, I'm still at MIT, so I should not do that. Um, and so let me tell you what this, what this talk is going to be about, um, which it's going to be entirely about some work that's joint with Anthony Conway and Mark Powell. And um, what we're, what we're going to study is, is some objects which, uh, well, it's, it's sort of not very original. Uh, we're, we're gonna, I'm going to try to study a little bit about manifolds and a little bit about knots in them. Um, but the context I'm going to be working in is that the dimension will be four. Um, and so in order to like <laughs> have a talk that contains uh, me convincing you that we know really anything at all, um, I need to put some really strong restrictions on what kind of four manifolds I'm talking about. So I'm going to assume that pi 1 of either the manifold or the surface is either um, trivial or z. <coughs> uh, <coughs> so, so some comments about what knots mean. Um, Dave made a compelling case yesterday that, that co-dimension 1 is an interesting place to study um, nodding, but I'm, again, being less original. Uh, knots will be co-dimension two, so, so you might want to think about this as surfaces. And then just like in classical knot theory, when I talk about the, the group of a knot, um, I want to talk about its complement. So all of my, my surfaces are going to live in simply connected spaces, and when I say the group of the, the surface, I mean the group of the complement. Okay, and, and then now what I, wanna, what I wanna try to do is tell you what we know about um, these, these objects in, in a few categories. So I'll tell you what we know about them topologically, um, what we know about them for the smooth closed setting, and uh, in the smooth uh, with boundary setting. Um, topologically, we know quite a lot. I'll state them more precisely, but um, for, for these groups, both for, for, for four manifolds and for surfaces in them, we have classification theorems. And the main theorem, um, that I'm going to talk about today is, is contributes towards this classification. <clears throat> okay, so, so we know quite a lot in the topological setting. For the setting with smooth closed manifolds, um, we also have started to make some progress on like the babyest case of this, which is, you know, we've taken kind of the simplest classification problem you can think of and we've, we've given it a name. So this is the, uh, this is the Poincaré conjecture. Uh, and for surfaces, there's something called the unknotting conjecture. And, and these are apparently hard problems. I'm, I'm not going to talk much about them uh, today because, because I don't have much to say. Um, but what I will talk about is, is the fact that appropriate analogs of these problems are a lot more approachable if you ask them about smooth manifolds with boundaries. So um, <clears throat> I'll talk a little bit about um, an analog of the Poincaré conjecture here, which is, uh, which is known to be false, and an analog of the unknotting conjecture here, which is also known to be false. So, so this is the plan. Um, before, before I get started, let me make one very important disclaimer, uh, which uh, is something you might already know, and it's that um, other groups exist. Uh, and we know a little bit about um, manifolds with other groups or surfaces with other groups. In the topological category, for example, for, for finite cyclic groups and, and something called bonds log, solvable bonds log solitaire groups, there's some classification work due to people like Hamilton, Craig Teichner. Um, for surfaces or, or manifolds, we have some exotic results for other groups as well, but, but these are the two that we have the most systematic understanding of, so I'm just gonna restrict attention to these groups. Good. Any questions before I get going? I'm gonna start by, in this category, stating a classification. Okay. So I'm going to try to state four theorems 
uh, all at the same time because um, as you might expect, the classification of, of manifolds with or without boundary and, and with one of these two groups looks very similar. So um, starting with, the, with sort of all the attributions, the, the theorem that you know is that um, Friedman in, in 82 gave us this classification um, of groups where, of, sorry, of manifolds where, <clears throat> ah, I'm, I'm going to start by, sorry, talking about the topological category and talking about manifolds. So, so Friedman classified <clears throat> simply connected uh, closed four manifolds. <clears throat> and a bit, a bit later, uh, Boyer classified simply connected manifolds with boundary. Um, <clears throat> for pi 1z, it's work of Friedman and Quinn. In the setting with no boundary. And um, the theorem that, that I'm going to tell you about is uh, a combination of work of my collaborators independently and then the three of us Uh, we're going to give a classification for pi 1z and with non-empty boundary. Okay. So <clears throat> the way I'm going to do the statement is that um, when I need to modify the classification a little bit for, for the setting where the group is z, I'll, I'll add a modification in, in green. <clears throat> so the statement is going to be that, that our set of objects, which is um, topological four manifolds, let me say with boundary, but I'm allowing the boundary to be the empty set, and uh, pi 1 g, where g is one of our two groups. Um, these manifolds, and I'll add a couple hypotheses in a second, these manifolds classified up to homeomorphism, uh, I'm going to say rel boundary. If there's no boundary, that doesn't mean anything. <coughs> Uh, this set of manifolds is in bijection with a set of, <clears throat> in the most generality, um, five invariants. So, so the statement I'm going to write here is not completely precise. Um, if I really wanted to state this as a sort of precise bijection, I'd need to give you a list of five like purely algebraic thingies over here that you can define without referencing the manifold. That statement's kind of a mess. So, so the way I'm going to state this now is, is sort of more intuitively. If you start with a four manifold with these properties, what are the, what's the, what are the pieces of data you need to write down to completely capture the manifold? Um, but we do also have a realization statement. So, so <clears throat> if you give me those invariants, then, then I can give you a manifold. Good. So um, the invariants, <clears throat> well, the first one is, um, is probably something you're expecting, it's the uh, homeomorphism type of the boundary. That's certainly something you need to record. Uh, if there is no boundary, there's not a lot of data there. <clears throat> the second thing you need to record is, is also kind of a very simple object. You need to know the um, inclusion map uh, from pi one of the boundary into pi one of the filling, okay? So if you have no boundary, neither of these are very interesting. The first invariant that shows up all the time, um, you're expecting, you know, Friedman's classification is in terms of the intersection form. So that is indeed what you want in the setting <clears throat> with no fundamental group. If you have fundamental group, uh, you want a, a modification of this called the equivariant intersection form, which I'll describe in just a moment. The fourth invariant is going to be kind of the most mysterious one. I think most people here won't have um, seen it before. It's something we're calling the automorphism invariant. Uh, <clears throat> I'll describe that as well in just a second. Uh, this invariant also uh, doesn't exist in the no boundary setting. And then the final invariant is, is a classical thing called the kirby siebeman invariant. Really loosely speaking, sort of topologically, you can think of this as measuring whether the manifold has a smooth structure. So, 
So, so this is the shape of, of all of the theorems. If, if you have no boundary, you really just see these two invariants. Um, if you have no fundamental group, then there's no data here either. So Boyer would maybe just have four, and, and we have five bits of data. Any, any questions about this statement? Yeah, Marco. Um, yeah, let's, yes, we do, um, but, but then, oh. Yeah, we do for simplicity, yeah. I think you could get away from that. Okay, um, there's a couple of um, hypotheses that, that I need to add here. Um, one of them is that I wanna be working with, with boundary a rational homology sphere or some appropriate um, analog of that. So H1 of the boundary of X, it needs to be torsion. A bit different if when pi one is z, I'll, I'll explain that. And um, I also want to know that the inclusion map from pi one of the boundary into pi one of the manifold is, is surjective. Okay. <clears throat> so um, the first things I want to do is, is tell you what these things are. Any more questions before I start that? So um, what you're familiar with is, is the plain old intersection form, which pairs elements of H2 and spits integers. And you know, generally I think of this as, as this, this form that, that tells you kind of what is the H2 of the manifold and how does it interact with itself. That's an invariant you can define for manifolds with pi 1z as well. Um, but it, it doesn't quite capture everything you need to know because if you have interesting pi 1, you might also want to record how does the, the H2 of the manifold interact with the pi 1. And a really elegant way to, to capture that is instead of looking at the homology of the space, you can look at the homology of the universal cover or in this case, the infinite cyclic cover. So the equivariant form pairs these homology groups and it's gonna spit Laurent polynomials. And I'll tell you in just a second exactly um, what it does, but, but before I do, let me maybe get a, get a running example going. So maybe you wanna think about your manifold as being S1 times B3 for starters. So I'm imagining this tube is, there's an S1 like this. I haven't identified the, the ends, but you can. Um, and then I want to attach a, uh, a two handle to this, maybe like this. So this is a, this is a perfectly nice, very simple four manifold with, with pi one Z. Um, and to compute its uh, equivariant intersection form, we'll need to look at the cover. So, so that's also very easy to understand. Uh, we see R times B3. And it now has a whole bunch of two handles stuck to it. Uh, and they, they happen to become three framed, but you shouldn't worry about that. Okay. So, so okay, let me, let me now tell you exactly what this form does. Just like the, the regular intersection form asks how do surfaces representing the classes intersect, uh, we're gonna do the same thing. So if you have a pair of classes, uh, let's say represented by uh, sigma and gamma, well, <clears throat> again, you wanna ask how sigma intersects, in this case, not just gamma, but all of the translates of gamma. So right, we'll see a sum. So, so in this case, um, 
Well, at first, if you sort of look at the, the homology of this cover, it, as, a, as a module over Z, it looks infinitely generated. I don't like to write down forms over infinitely generated modules. So, so you want to think about this, in fact, as being a ZTT inverse module. At which point, it becomes finitely generated. Let's say it's generated by like this two handle here. And then, well, okay, we just have to ask ourselves, you know, if I take a class running once over this handle, how does it interact with itself? Um, so we'll see self-intersection three from the framing, but then we also have to record how does this class intersect this, and we see a minus one from the linking. And then if, if i is larger than one, well, we don't have any intersections between these. Uh, for i minus one, we get a t, and, and that's it. So, so this is what the equivariant form looks like in this case. Question. If the boundary is not empty, um, yeah. So, so the other sort of more interesting invariant on this list is, is the automorphism invariant. And to tell you sort of geometrically what this is measuring, um, let me remind you that um, you know, when you have this uh, H1 torsion hypothesis that, that we have, there's a short exact sequence which uh, looks like this. This is what you see in that simply connected case. So this should be very familiar. And um, if you're working with a manifold with, with pi 1z, you, you sort of also have a sequence like this on the covers. And what the automorphism in, invariant is doing morally is capturing um, this map right here. So, so sort of in a, in a picture, if you have um, your, your boundary manifold and you have some H1 class in there, well, what the automorphism invariant is telling you is, is which relative class should it be the boundary of? I'm not going to say anything more precise about what this invariant is. You can, you can make it precise algebraically. Um, let me just sort of try to say uh, something about why, why you should be expecting to need to record something like this. So if you think about maybe trying to prove the surge activity result here, um, somebody's going to give you some data and you're going to need to build them a, a four manifold with boundary and pi 1z. Um, <clears throat> well, as you know, you, you can sort of imagine what data you're going to want to be told. So you know you have to have pi 1z. They're going to tell you what you want the boundary manifold to be. But you know, we know that there's a relationship between pi 1 of the boundary manifold and, and pi 1 of the filling. So you have to ask them, like, don't just tell me the boundary. Tell me what that relationship should be. And that's this right here. Okay? And then the next thing they specify is what they want the H2 to be. Now it should interact with itself. That's great. That's this. But then you know, you know there's a relationship between H1 of the boundary and H2 of the filling, and, and that's what the automorphism invariant is asking you to record. Questions here? So, so I want to sketch how the proof of this result goes in the surge activity setting. Um, the breakdown here is that we proved surge activity. My collaborators had proved injectivity a bit before. <coughs> um, and the proof is the, the out 
outline is very straightforward. It, it follows sort of in, in four steps. So the first step is, is just to begin with the boundary that, that has been insisted upon. So start with M cross I. And then what you want to do is you want to attach two handles to it in a way sort of that's instructed by the intersection form, the equivariant form, and the automorphism invariant. Like somebody has insisted on what the H2 should be and how it should line up with the boundary, and you're just going to force that by, by putting two handles here in, in sort of the way that you were told to do it. A couple, of, a couple of comments about this. Um, this, so far, uh, what we've built is smooth. Uh, and this step here is the main technical work. Once you've, once you've attached all your two handles, you sort of have some new um, M prime. And, uh, well, what you, what you have to, to show is that um, the, the homology of the, the cover of this upper boundary, sort of the one that is associated to the, to the inclusion map on pi 1 down here, the cover of this is, um, has no H1 as a ZTT inverse module. So we have this hypothesis here where, where sort of H1 of the boundary was, was torsion. That's something like being a rational homology sphere. And, and what you show here is that after you finish adding your two handles, what you get is something like an analog of being an integer homology sphere. And, and the reason you want to know that is because uh, you can show that such, uh, such a manifold, such an M prime, bounds a topological homotopy S1. Okay, so, so this step here is where the proof is just topological. So this maybe seems very strong and very surprising, but, but in fact, you, you already know a theorem like this. In the simply connected case, you know that Friedman proved that integer homology sphere is all bound contractible. So this is a pi 1z analog of, of that. Okay, good. So, so once you have a, a, a homotopy S1 filling of M prime, you can stick it up here and define this whole thing to be your x. And, and finally, you just verify that x has the right invariance. No, sorry, G is one of my two permitted um, groups here. That would be a really great theorem that we definitely did not prove. Uh. More questions? Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, where does the restriction that um, H1 of boundary is, is torsion come in? Um, I mean, in fact, a, a few places you, um, but, but maybe one that you can see is that um, this, this sequence wouldn't necessarily be short without it, um, but it also, um, you want it to get a little bit of control over what the equivariant form can be as well. Um, Boyer, by the way, does not need it. His theorem, does, he, he can remove it and the theorem will look very different, but he can remove it. Uh, we did not pursue removing it. Okay. So this is what I uh, what I wanted to say about manifolds. Um, I'm going to move on to talking about surfaces. Anything lingering be before?
Um, so then again, I'll start in the um, <coughs> topological category. And, and here, uh, as, I, as I said in the beginning, we, we, we again have classification theorems. So um, Boyer's work uh, gives a classification of, oh, sorry, let me, um, let me give a whole bunch of setup before I get going. So, so the settings we're always going to be working in when I talk about surfaces is that X is going to be a topological manifold with uh, pi 1 trivial. The boundary of X is either going to be empty or S3. Uh, all of my surfaces are going to be proper. And uh, what, what I'm going to use for an equivalence here is that I'm going to say that in either category, a pair of surfaces are, are the same if there's a homeomorphism or diffeomorphism of pairs. You, you can, um, there are results uh, about everything I'll say in this section if, if instead you say isotopy, but, but it's a bit messier. <coughs> and then the groups we're really interested in are the not groups, and, and again, that's not going to be everything. It's going to be either one or zero. So now in this context, um, we have some classifications. So Boyer gives us a classification when pi 1 of the, the complement is 1 and the surface is closed. And our work gives a classification when pi 1 of the complement is z and the surface can have boundary or, or not. Um, and, and I'm not going to state the whole classification here. It looks rather similar to this. So let me just say that classifications exist. Um, a comment is, is that there's, there's, it's not written down in the literature for simply connected complements for uh, surfaces with boundary, but, but it's recoverable from this. So in the smooth category for surfaces, um, there's this motivating conjecture, which is, which is called the unknotting conjecture. And what the unknotting conjecture uh, says is that there is supposed to be a unique S2 in S4 with pi 1z. So in the topological category, um, this is a theorem uh, for most genera. Uh, so Friedman proved this for genus zero surfaces. And Conway and Powell proved this. for genus greater than two. Um, before you ask, it's open in genus one and two. It, it's probably true, but, but their techniques kind of break down. So, so this conjecture appears to be uh, rather difficult for, um, for closed surfaces, but um, let me try to tell you a little bit about what we um, what we do and don't know about them. So um, uh, and, and before I do that, let me make a definition. We'll say that a surface is exotic if there exists another surface Which is, which is topologically but not smoothly equivalent to it.
so <clears throat> I, I, you can ask, um, or you, the, a nodding conjecture is asking, um, is there an exotic uh, pi 1z sphere in, in S4? And, and what we know is that um, there exist exotic surfaces in some closed four manifolds uh, with pi 1z, sorry, with, with no pi 1, that's work of Fentuschel and Stern. And um, it's work of Kim and Ruberman with pi 1z. And we, we don't have, so, so the anodic conjecture wants you to find exotic surfaces in the simplest manifolds you can work in. Um, we're not great at finding exotic surfaces in, in particularly simple manifolds, but, but there is sort of one uh, very good thing that, that we can do, which is, which is this work of um, Hoffman and Sanukjian, which says there are exotic surfaces in the trivial homology class in some manifolds. And, and this is important because if you're going to try to produce exotic surfaces in S4, then they're certainly going to have to live in the, in the trivial class. Uh, they are genus one, yeah. Uh, I think that there are genus G surfaces in some some big manifolds. In particular, exotic sorry, exotic genus zero surfaces in bigger manifolds. In particular, um, in certain exotic manifolds, stabilized with S two times S two. But, um, but, there's, but there's sort of still a lot we, we sort of we don't know here. So um, we don't know whether there exists exotic in S4 of any genus. We don't know whether there is, uh, for example, an exotic CP1 in CP2. So this is a, sort of a pi 1 Z setting. This is a no pi 1 setting. Um, and we also don't know, like, I don't know, more globally, like, uh, given, if you're given some random four manifold, can you find an exotic closed surface? So, so these problems are, um, especially these, apparently very hard for, for closed surfaces, but, but something that happens a lot, um, or sort of a common theme for, for smooth manifolds is, is that if you work with boundary, things get easier. So um, what I want to do with the rest of the time is, is tell you that we, we know uh, answers to questions like these in, in the, for smooth manifolds with boundary and try to sketch, sketch a proof there. Uh, questions before I do. The main result that I sort of want to tell you, and, and in fact it's the result that I'll sketch, is, is this really wonderful work of, of Kyle Hayden in 2019, and he showed that there exist exotic D2 embedded in B4 with pi 1z. And he doesn't write it down, but his work also shows that there are exotic uh, D2 in punctured CP2 with no pi 1. So, so that's kind of an answer to these two questions in the setting where you have boundary. 
Um, and with Mark and Anthony, uh, we, we answered sort of a version of, of this question in the setting with boundary. So um, let's say for any two handle body X <coughs> with uh, S3 boundary, there exists exotic B2 in X. And, and all of these theorems uh, can also be sort of kicked up to surfaces of any genus. This is kind of the simplest. So for the rest of the time, um, I want to outline, uh, in fact, a proof of, of Kyle's result. Our proof um, relies on what Kyle does, and then, you know, and then you sort of need to do more. But the techniques Kyle uses are, I think, really beautiful and, and also sort of very common in the literature about exotic manifolds or surfaces with boundaries. So, so let me sort of try to give you a flavor of, of what what that looks like. Uh, questions before I before I do. So uh, let me start off by, by reminding you of, of a couple of facts. Um, this notation, a dotted circle, this is used to denote S1 times uh, B3. And if we have a dotted circle and a, let me just say, zero frame two handle, um, linking it as the hop link, well, this is B4. And the boundary of this is exactly the zero surgery on this Hopf link, which is S3, as, as you know. Um, so, so you know this, but, but Kyle's argument is, is really just this, this sort of beautiful little um, trick with this sort of very standard stuff. So um, Kyle's argument is, is very straightforward. What we need to do is, um, one, build a pair of disks. With pi 1z. And such that they are uh, topologically equivalent. And then we're going to show that, that their complements are not diffeomorphic. And this will in particular show that there can have been a, a diffeomorphism of pairs and, and so they can't be smoothly equivalent. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build some disks for you explicitly. Um, let, me, let me start off by, by drawing a picture. So what we have here is a four manifold built out of a one handle and a two handle. And <clears throat> well, I've, I've drawn a circle in it and I'll explain that in a second. Um, if you squint at this picture, you'll see that while it looks messy right now, in fact, the, the one and two handle can be isotoped just to look like this. So this is really just a picture of the four ball. So, so this green curve that I've drawn, that's some knot in S3. And in fact, we can see in this picture that the, that knot in S3 bounds a disk in the four ball because you can just take this little disk and push it a bit below the two handle. So there's some disk here. <clears throat> so in fact, instead of thinking about this as a knot, let's think about it as a disk. And well, 
Well, let me leave it like that for, for a moment. So this is going to be one of our disks, D. Uh, to describe the other disk, let me, let me again uh, draw a picture quickly. Uh, I'll tell, I'll ask you that question in a second. Uh, Okay, so, so this should look like exactly the same picture I had before. Um, and again, I'm going to think of it as a zero and a one handle, um, but I'm going to order them in the other direction. Like because in your head you checked that, that this was a hop link before, I, I'm allowed to put the dot and the zero in the other order. And that will again give me some sort of convoluted looking diagram of the four ball. So again, this green curve, this is some knot in the boundary of the four ball. And in fact, it's exactly the same knot as we had before, right? Because the boundary of this four ball is like bang on identified with the boundary of this four ball. They have exactly the same surgery diagram. So these are the same two knots, okay? And then something that's a little bit less obvious in this picture, um, but, but still true, is that this knot here in, in sort of this four ball, this also bounds a disk. And the, the way you see that is that um, if you close this up right here, you would be able to, to drag the, the two handle around so that this only had intersections with the two handle. And then it would be able to bound a disk for the same reason this does. Okay. Great. So, so this is this pair of disks in, in the four ball. They have the same boundary. And, um, and it's not too difficult to check that, that indeed their complements have pi 1z. Um, we know how to describe their complements. It's actually just to, to think of these as themselves uh, dotted circles. And um, well, in, in this case, for example, you can then just read off pi 1 uh, and n. It turns out to be z. So these, turn, these are these, these two disks. They have the same boundary. They're both in the four ball. They both have pi 1z. And then you can just appeal to the classification to decide that, that, that they are indeed topologically equivalent. So let me, let me break for questions there about the construction. So too. Now I just have to show that, that these complements here, which are in fact the, the manifolds whose handle diagrams are drawn here, I just have to show that these are not diffeomorphic. <clears throat> um, the first thing you want to observe, and this is something you can just uh, sort of check using, using Snappy because we, we know a whole lot about three manifolds, you, you check that the mapping class group of the boundary of, <clears throat> well, either of these surface complements, check that this is trivial. So, so what this tells me is that if I did have a diffeomorphism, well, it would have to restrict to um, only this, this, it would have to restrict to this one map on the boundary. And, you know, in fact, I can reasonably call this map the identity map because I have this, this, this exactly the same um, surgery diagram of these two boundaries. So, so schematically, what, what we see going on here is that if we had a diffeomorphism, well, on the boundary, it would have to be the identity. Good. Okay. 
So, so what that tells me is that if I had some homology class in the boundary, uh, then I could take uh, slightly bigger manifolds, which are um, built by attaching two handles along that, that homology class, say this is W and this is W prime. And, and these would be uh, diffeomorphic because I can just use the identity map on the handles. So this seems a little bit uh, gnarly, like we wanted to show that these manifolds weren't diffeomorphic and what I've done here is I've made them bigger. Uh, that maybe seems unnecessary, but, but what's, what's really great about this stuff is that these manifolds now have some H2 if you add enough two handles. And in particular, maybe, maybe you want to add two handles here and here. And now, as, as Andras told you um, the other day, the genus function steps in as a really great way of showing that these manifolds aren't diffeomorphic. So, for example, um, you can ask, let's say, sort of any constructive four-manifold topologist uh, to show you that there's a sphere generating homology here. And you can ask um, Paolo to show you that there's not a, a minus one sphere generating homology here. <clears throat> so, so I'm going to stop with this. This is this is this sort of very classic argument, um, and and ours is is kind of an extension of this. Thanks. <laughs> Well, um, I guess I mean, I have surgery diagrams of both disc complements, which are literally the same as, as surgery diagrams. Um, so if you, if, you, if you feel very strongly that I not call it the identity, that's, that's fine. I'll call it the like, pointwise fix map on this surgery diagram of the boundary. Yeah, um, it's, uh, it's because, oh, sorry, I'm supposed to repeat the question. Uh, w why did I draw this um, looking like a front projection? And, and the reason is because um, for, for once you've added some two handles to this disk complement, it's easy to check that this is a Stein manifold, and therefore it's not allowed to have a minus one sphere. Um, yeah, I guess it's, it's just kind of uh, an augmentation of the, the standard Maser cork. Um, maybe we, we need to get a little more creative in this field, but uh, a good, something we use all the time to produce Exotica is, is this, this little contractible guy. And you know what, what Kyle has essentially done is said, instead of this class, I'll, I'll think about kind of removing my disk right there. Now, you don't want to use this because it turns out not to have pi 1z. Um, and it also has uh, the, the mapping class group of this complement once you appropriately surgery is not trivial. Um, but, but then you just wiggle this example uh, to, to 
try to have pi one z and trivial mapping class group and, and that's a, a solution. Yeah, um, so, so the question is how do you improve this argument to, to prove the more general theorem for, for any two-handle body? Um, so what you do is you start with a, a handle diagram of your two-handle body, um, and then off to the side you just drill out a trivial disk for the unknot. <clears throat> and now what, what I'm going to try to do is, is modify that picture until I, I have something where, where I'll have more than one disk. So, so the first thing you do is you kind of start running the, the two handles through that, that trivial one handle to sort of set up whatever algebraic topology you're looking for. Um, and then you, then you try to get uh, a picture that looks relatively Stein from that by, by also adding some, some stuff which has large TB but doesn't contribute to anything else. And then maybe you use a trick like Kyle's to add something where you have a pair of disks and then an argument like this goes. 